On today's episode, I interview 29-time Emmy award-winning producer turned business owner Bill Stainton about innovating quickly, waiting too long to realize he was in business, and how scheduled thinking time may be the most important space for leaders to make. I'm Julie B., and they don't teach this in business school. Hey there, I'm Julie B, and you're listening to They Don't Teach This in Business School, a podcast where we discuss business ownership lessons that are learned through experience, not in a classroom or seminar. I have to tell you all that I'm really excited for today's guest. I'm interviewing Emmy Award winning producer turned business owner, Bill Stainton. These days, he's a keynote speaker and consultant, and I know we're going to have a fun conversation about some of the lessons he has learned on his own business ownership journey. So Bill, welcome to the show today. I'm really excited to have you here with me and the listeners. Thanks, Julie. I've been looking forward to this. So Bill, why don't you give us an overview of your business these days? And if you want to tell a little story about your background, that's fine too, because it's really fascinating. But (laughs) I I want people to really know what you do these days and uh, just, yeah, go into that a little bit. Sure. Yeah. And the two are kind of tied together. Um, Loosely, perhaps. Um, these days, I, I I speak, I coach, I consult, I work with teams on innovation, creativity, breakthrough thinking, basically helping them think differently about their world and about their business. Because I'm sure you found so many times we kind of get in a rut. We, we, we ask the same questions and we just wonder why we're not moving ahead. And it's because, you know, we're looking at the situation the same way all the time and mm-hmm. coming up with the same answers. Mm-hmm. So... I help people become, um, again, sometimes I say innovation, but that's, that scares some people Mm -hmm. because they think, oh, innovation, that sounds risky. That sounds expensive. By the way, it's not either of those, but, um, uh, so that's what I do. The way I got into that is my background is in oddly enough in comedy television for 15 years, excuse me. I produced the longest running highest rated and most award-winning regional comedy TV show in the United States where our job, like literally week after week after week was to be innovative, was to think differently every single week on demand, whether we felt like it or not. And there Mm -hmm. were a lot of weeks when we didn't. And so that's when I learned that it's not about, you know, waiting for inspiration to strike. There are, there are tools, there are techniques, there are ways to get your brain to think creatively, innovatively, to think differently, whether you feel like it or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you were in a world where you were forced you I mean you had to like you said you had to be creative so you had to figure out a way on those everybody goes through a slump um yeah. no matter what you do but when oh, you yeah. you know when you have to continue to deliver at that high level of creativity you got to figure yeah. out a way to get around it yeah exactly and it's yeah we, when you say that about everybody goes through a slump I mean there were times where I had you know I and the rest of my team we, we had to write jokes you know going through divorce uh, death of a pet, death of a, of a parent, you know, things mm-hmm. like, things like, and then, you know, come back and write mm-hmm. the jokes because that's the job. And now in business, it's kind of the same way. Your customers, your clients, your team doesn't really care if you're having a bad day. Oh, they might care because they're good people, but mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of like if you, if you dish out, you know, $6,000 to see Springsteen or $300 to go see Hamilton, mm-hmm. Do you care if the guy playing King George is going through a tiff with his significant other? No, mm-hmm. nor should you. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing with our class. Well, the same thing in, in my old world of television, mm-hmm. same thing with the audience. The audience doesn't care, nor should they have to. That's not their job to take care of us. And as mm-hmm. business owners, it's the same thing. You know, yeah. we, we got to take care of our own stuff because our clients don't really care. They're counting on us to do what we say we're going to do. Yeah. Uh, and do it when we say we're going to do it. Yeah. So talking about business ownership then a little bit, I, what is your favorite part of being a business owner? Um, I think my favorite part, and maybe it's the most dangerous part too, Julie, I'll be, I'll be <laughs> curious to hear, hear what you think about this, is that I can try things instantly. Like I can have an idea tonight and roll it out tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um. And that's that's exciting because oh I can create something oh something new something shiny let's try it let's throw it out there and I think that's by and large a good thing because then you know 
you know as well as I do, the universe will tell you whether it's good or not. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, but but I I I love that that you don't have to go through the bureaucracy and the channels. Mm-hmm. Now, if it's something major, then yeah, you get your team involved. Whatever your team, even if your team is just you and your philodendron, mm-hmm. um, you know, you get, you get them involved. But I, I I think the ability to to turn to react to create mm-hmm. on a dime. I don't know. I mean, have you found that to be true with your world? I I yeah, that's one thing that I love as well. Being able to just try something and and put it into action pretty quickly i think that's that, that's probably one yeah. of my own favorite parts and then have the world just owner. slap you down and say that was a stupid idea well on the other side of that is it's funny i was actually talking to my mom the other day and i said mom i fail probably eight out of ten times every day yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. that's like the other <laughs> side of it right like you know if you are going to the more things you try the more things that are not going to work but you hope that within that you find the things that are that are just outstanding and really do work and I would love for you to tell the story you told me when we did the interview I think you know the one I'm talking about um and I think that can illustrate I know it's from your producer days but I think that that can illustrate how just trying something can sometimes have exponentially amazing results okay i think i know the one you're talking about and it's it happened when something went wrong because um for you folks maybe just getting started in business things are going to go wrong uh they are i mean we only hear about the successes we don't hear about the eight things that went wrong and so we think oh i'm failing because i'm not having all these successes well no those successes followed a string of failures also so here's what happened we we were doing a show uh we, we um we we shot our show on saturday I mean, we shot the tape pieces throughout the week, but then mm-hmm. on Saturday night, you know, the audience would come in and, and we do, you know, the, the live on tape, as we call it, but in front of a live studio audience. And we were pumped. This is back in the, in the um, like, uh, uh, late 80s, 87, January 10th, 1987. It's a Saturday. And we're pumped because we got in a genuine big name. Now, Seattle in the late 80s was not the hub that it is now. There was no Microsoft. There was no Starbucks. There was no Amazon. There was, you know, nothing like that. Um so it was tough to get good guests, but we got one. We got Johnny Depp. Um, yeah. Now let's be clear: this is pre wackadoodle Johnny Depp. Uh, but anyhow, so we got Johnny Depp. He was he was uh, starring in a TV show called Twenty One Jump Street, mm-hmm. and they just shot a few hours north of us in Vancouver. So I called him, and you know, turns out he knew our show, and we knew his, and so you want to be a guest. So so the day of the show comes around, and we are like, this is going to be so cool because we got you know we got this major star Johnny Depp is going to be on the show. And around 10, 30 or 11 o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call from Johnny Depp and he cancels. He didn't want to. I mean, he was he was mm-hmm. very nice about it, but he said, you know, they scheduled reshoots for Jump Street. And, I, you know, I tried to get out of it, but I can't. So, I, you know, I've got to cancel. Well, this is a train wreck. I mean, this is disaster time. It's the day of the show. <laughs> and you've had this happen in your world, Julie. I know you have. And everybody listening and watching this, you've had this happen where you think you've done everything right. Mm-hmm. And 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 you have, but then all of a sudden the universe just pulls the rug out from under you, and it's like, oh man, what are we gonna do? I, I don't. I'm... So we just start tossing out ideas. You know, we're in Seattle. It's got to be somebody local. Oh, what about the Seahawks? No, they're out of town. Yeah, you know, and we just keep mm-hmm. throwing out names, and nothing's working <laughs> for whatever reason. And meanwhile, the clock is ticking because you know at some point the audience is going to show up. They're going to be expecting a show. Mm-hmm. So we're just it's it's looking hopeless when one of my that actually was my lowest paid writer pops his head up and says well you know look maybe i could do something with 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 liquid nitrogen which scared the hell out of all of us because he Mm -hmm. was a little bit crazy and like liquid clearly he didn't understand the situation basically yeah Yeah, we're looking for a guest to interview but eventually you know we're like we run out of other ideas so we have to go with this stupid idea for my lowest paid writer whose name was bill nye and that night, my lowest paid writer, Bill Nye, became Bill Nye, the science guy. Mm-hmm. And it was a hit. And it was all because Johnny Depp canceled. It was all because of this disaster. And we had to, you know, we had to innovate. We had to think differently. But for a while, I wasn't because I, I had blinders on. I, I I couldn't see the gold that was right there mm-hmm. because I was so focused on we have to get a guest to interview. We have to get a guest to interview. So I I, I wasn't. I think of myself as an open person, but I wasn't open to what I call, you know, the the yellow dot, the different idea, mm-hmm, the, mm-hmm. the the outside look. 
Uh, but all of a sudden, when we open ourselves up to that, it's like, ooh, ooh, that that might work. And and it did. It you did. know, he's a cultural icon. Yeah. Still a little bit crazy, but you know, still. <laughs> just just amazing. Um, and the fact that I mean, even you probably didn't even know he truly had the science experiment experience that he has, you know, at that time. Oh no, we like, knew that. See, that's that's the thing. Okay. And I would yeah. encourage anybody listening to think about your team. Like what's mm-hmm. what skill sets do they bring to that you haven't even thought about tapping into? Because it may be, you know, something that doesn't specifically apply to what you do day to day. No, we knew that Bill and I had this engineering science background. Mm-hmm. In fact, when we were on break, uh, I, I was full time, but most of my team, like during the summer, they had to get other jobs. Uh, Bill and I would do work for Boeing, which is a little local airplane company we have up here. <laughs> Just a little uh, one. Mm-hmm. He would do work that people like you and I are not allowed to know about. Mm mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Because it was like super secret kind of stuff. So we knew he had that, but I just, you know, I I didn't make that connection, which is what innovation is all about. It's all about connecting dots, making different connections. And I was the poster child for, nope, sorry, can't see it, won't Mm -hmm. see it. Um, Partly because he was the lowest paid writer. Yeah. And you and I both know that good ideas only come from senior management. Of course. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the lowest paid writer, the quiet person, the introvert, the new person, the intern can't possibly have a good idea, right? Well, <laughs> you never know who's going to have that, the missing piece to the puzzle. Hey, this is Julie B. and you're listening to They Don't Teach This in Business School. I'm here with Bill Stanton and he just told a really great, interesting, fun innovative story about how Bill Nye the Science Guy became Bill Nye the Science Guy. Um, but Bill, I wanted to bring it back around to your business these days. And one of the questions I, I love to ask my guests are, uh, is, is what, what has been your biggest win as a business owner? I figured that Bill Nye's story was probably one of your biggest wins as a producer, but in your own business today, what's been one of your biggest wins? Wow. That's a great question. You ask really good questions. Thank um, <laughs> Uh, one of my biggest wins has been, I think, well, staying in business successfully through a pandemic. Uh, my business is primarily based, although not exclusively, and I'm I'm switching that around now. Up until the pandemic, was primarily based on me being a keynote speaker. I mm-hmm. was not. I, I was inducted into the Speaker Hall of Fame uh, a few years ago, and so that's what I did. I got on airplanes and I went into rooms packed full of people. And then the pandemic hit and rooms packed full of people stopped being a thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, you know, now what do you do when all of a sudden your entire income stream dries up in a weekend? Mm -hmm. Well, you've got to, you've got to think differently. Mm -hmm. You've got to start doing other things. So this goes kind of back to your first question, the Mm -hmm. ability to reinvent. Mm -hmm. And I know pivot was an overused word, Mm -hmm. but, but the ability to look at, okay, what is it that we really do? It, and it's 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 basically asking a different question. It's kind of like with 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 the Bill Nye story I just told. Mm-hmm. We were all asking, "Who can we get as a guest to interview?" Bill Nye asked a different question. He was asking, mm-hmm. "How can we fill the time?" Mm-hmm. Which you can see changes the entire context. Yeah. So when the pandemic hit, I was thinking, "Okay, I'm a keynote speaker. I'm a keynote speaker." Wow, there I got blinders on again. It's like, no, I'm not. I'm an expert. I'm an authority on innovation, on thinking differently, on breakthrough thinking. That kind. Of, well, I don't have to get on a stage to do that. I can do that right mm-hmm. here. I I I I work with. I do workshops all the time. Why why not make that a bigger part of what I do? And and you can do that virtually. You can do that in person. So just the ability to actually kind of uh, take my own advice, mm-hmm. I think, which we oftentimes we don't do. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have all this wisdom that we impart. Wisdom sometimes it's real wisdom, sometimes it's not. But you know that we mm-hmm. impart. And 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 share and disseminate with our with our clients, and um, and then we just go back and do exactly the opposite in our own world. Yes. So I think, um, yeah, like I listen, I I listened to, to, to your podcast. I was just listening to your uh, episode with Emily from a few weeks ago, who's, mm-hmm. who was speaking about humor and that sort of thing. And it's like, oh, that, oh, that's a good reminder. That's a good reminder. Everything is a good reminder if we just <laughs> do it. Yeah, I literally coming into. Uh, 2023 
I, one of my goals was to implement three, just three, just three pieces of leadership advice that I've given over the past three years on my podcast, because again, it's, you know, these things and you know, these things. And I mean, I coach other leaders all the time yes. on my own medicine. And sometimes I'm the worst at taking it. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? I don't know why that is, but that seems to be almost universal. It really? It, yeah, it, it was. That's also, I could say that's also true for uh, my own marketing agency. I think we're, we're probably the worst at marketing ourselves, but thankfully we get well <laughs> for clients. So, you know, they, they send us referrals. So that works out. <laughs> yeah. It's always easier to toot somebody else's horn. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously, yeah, staying and being in business and also as a speaker going through a pandemic where you had to completely not, you know, change how you were offering services at that time and, and come up with some new services and new offerings to, right. to survive. Obviously a big win. So I always love to ask the opposite question. What's your biggest failure in business or your biggest mistake in business that you've made? I think the the biggest mistake is waiting way too long to realize that I'm actually running a business. <laughs> okay. What happened was, so when, when, when Almost Live, which was my TV show, when they finally stopped production, I was going to say when it when they finally canceled it, but then they kept running reruns for like another 10 or 15 years, mm -hmm. which I got paid zero. <laughs> um, but um, when that went off, went, went off the air, um, I became a speaker through a number of things. I, I just, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I became a keynote speaker. And for the longest time, and I mean like, you know, a decade or more, I basically treated it like a glorified hobby. I mean, I didn't know anything about, you know, what a PL statement is. I didn't know what a balance sheet was. I didn't know how to run a business. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I was I was a really good speaker and I got to be an even better speaker. Today I'm 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 among the best. Mm -hmm. Um speaking about tooting my own horn, but you know, <laughs> they don't just let anybody into the Hall of Fame. Okay. Um but as a business person, that's a completely different thing it kind of goes back to gerber's the e-myth that you know mm -hmm. it's one thing to be good at what you do but then then you've got to run the business mm -hmm. behind it the whole back end behind it and um th that was that was the biggest mistake. it took me the longest time and now i'm i'm still playing catch up mm -hmm. i'm still learning you know how to read the numbers and set kpis and you know track certain metrics and things like that and again run it run it like like a business figure yeah. out okay how do you do a, a salary? You don't just do a salary when there's money, mm -hmm. you know, because that's that's what I did for like, well, if it's a good month, I'll take a bigger salary. If it's a bad month, I'll take it. No, that's that's not how a business runs. No. Uh, and, so and, I, and that's probably one of the hardest, I think, lessons for business owners is to pay yourself first. You know, that's the advice yes. that you're given when you're investing in a 401k, yes. when you work somewhere else or when Absolutely. you're you know, building your own read, savings. Read the book. <laughs> Read the book Profit First by Michael, and his last name is unpronounceable, but he's written mm -hmm. some great books. But Profit First mm -hmm. is a is a great book. If you yeah yeah even even if you're only paying yourself twenty dollars a month yeah if you something. can do that consistently it's just it's just to get the system to get the pattern to get that habit mm -hmm. of this this comes out every month before anything else gets done absolutely. So kind of going down this path a little bit further, one of the things that I talk a lot about and coach quite a bit on is burnout. And I want to ask yeah. you if you've ever experienced it. And if you have, no. maybe share a story can't or two. <laughs> can't, can't relate. Yeah, yeah, we all we all have experienced burnout. Uh, I know there was a, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, back in the early days of producing my TV show, before I knew what, what I was doing, you know, when, when we first kind of started the show, I was easily putting in 100-hour weeks, mm -hmm. easily, every mm -hmm. single week, just to get the show done. And then when we got to year like 12, 13, 14, 15, it kind of became, okay, I know what I'm doing now. But there was um, there was a month, it was my my first six-figure month, I think, as a speaker. Mm -hmm. um, and it was in October, which tends to be a busy month for speakers. There are a lot of conferences and things. Mm -hmm. And I was either on stage or on an airplane every single day of the month, every single day, which was great for the bank account, mm -hmm. fabulous for the bank account. But the, but I was exhausted at the end of it. And I was always worried because mm -hmm. it's October. You're always worried about what's the weather over O'Hare. 
am I going to make it to the next gig? So there's all, there's this, all this pressure. And it's like, why, why did I say yes to all these? And I think because I was thinking scarcity. Yeah. I can't say no because there may never be another opportunity. I didn't know how to say no to clients that weren't the right fit. I didn't know how to say no for my own well-being and my own mental, physical, and emotional health. Mm-hmm. I've I've kind of learned that lesson now. But it's but we do get this burnout. And I think a lot of it is because of the day-to-day whirlwind that we get caught up in. You know, there's so much to do. We think, well, when things just finally, you know, when when, when things calm down, I'll get to this other important thing. Mm-hmm. You know, you and I both know things are never going to calm down. They're never going to calm down. Mm-hmm. So one of the, one of the things I learned is the magic of the calendar. Mm. If you put something on a calendar, it'll get done. If it's not on a calendar, it won't get done. So now I literally schedule time in each week just for me to think, just thinking time. And sometimes that means like listening to a podcast yeah. or reading a book. Sometimes it means like, Let's just ask myself an interesting question about my business or about what my clients might be going through. And let's spend 15, 20 minutes, a half an hour just thinking about that. But it's in it's in my calendar as an appointment with myself. Mm-hmm. So if somebody says, hey, yo, can can we talk on Friday at two o'clock? No, we can't. I have an I appointment. Have. Yeah, exactly. And I that that is actually one of the things that I practice as well. And it keeps me from burning out. Like if I know if I know I'm not having thinking time, then I know I'm getting closer to possibly burning out. And so few, so few business owners make time to think. And then Isn't that amazing? It, it, but you're I mean, absolutely they'll, right. They'll do things, I mean, they will read books sometimes, but they're so busy that they don't have time to think and at at that point you're you're going to stifle your innovation and your creativity if you don't give yourself some space because that's for me I know my most creative ideas or innovative ideas usually happen when I'm paddle boarding or when I'm walking or they don't happen when I'm sitting right here at this desk very rarely do do they happen here and that's the other part is I think if you're not taking time to think, no matter how you accomplish that, accomplish that, you're going to have a really difficult time innovating. Absolutely. And you said two things that are that I think are really important. Um, first of all, yes, leaders don't take time to think. Sometimes they read. And look, reading is great. I'm a huge fan of reading. I'm, I always have at least like four or five books going at one time, mm-hmm. uh, including both fiction and nonfiction. Mm-hmm. Um but reading is not the same as thinking. It's not even the same as thinking about what you're reading. Because a lot of us read, and we might even highlight, but do we then go like, ooh, do I agree with that? Mm-hmm. Here's why. Do I disagree with that? Here's why. I mean, do we actually think about it? Yeah. But the other thing you said is like paddleboarding and walking. You know, um, I I read a study. I can't remember where I read it, but I read a study where they, um, they uh, did a, like look back at I think it was something like the hundred most creative people of the last 200 years or something like that. Clearly a subjective list, but still, Mm -hmm. um, but they kind of looked at this like, like what are their habits? You know, are there anything? The one thing, the one thing that they all had in common was walking, was taking walks. Mm. Because it is true. You need to change your, 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 your context, your location, Mm -hmm. because we spend so much time, you there with, with your awards mm-hmm. in the background, me here with my awards in the background. We spend so much time here that our brain kind of goes into like, oh, okay, it, it's kind of, you know, like default mode. Mm-hmm. But you go out and start doing something else. Yeah. And all of a sudden your brain's like, oh, this is unfamiliar. This is different. And now you can start making connections because you're not in in background mode. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So yeah, it is. Yes. Yeah, um, there's a community center just, oh, five miles from, from where I am now mm-hmm. that sometimes I'll go there uh, maybe once or twice a week, I'll go there and just like take my computer or not, maybe take a book or just a notepad mm-hmm. and just go there and say, okay, I'm going to be here for two hours mm-hmm. and I'll just, maybe I'll come up with something. Maybe I won't, but I'm, mm-hmm. I'm someplace different. And it's, you're right. It's amazing how many ideas will come because you're not in familiar territory. So your brain doesn't have the familiar neural pathways mm-hmm to go through it's kind of forced to think differently because you've given it different stimulus and i i talk about 
a lot about making space. And when people hear that initially, they automatically go to time. And of course, I hear I don't have any more time, but I will right. literally, if, if, if there is a very strong objection at the time level, what I will recommend people do sometimes is plan to do the same exact work. Just go to the conference room instead of being in your office. Or, you know, if you work from home, go sit at your kitchen table instead of sitting in your office. And yeah. you'll be surprised yeah. at just that, even if, even if it's the same exact work you were planning to do just that change in your physical location can open up new ideas and new creativity if you're that's willing to do advice. it. That's yeah. fabulous advice. And what I love about it is that um, it's free. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. It doesn't take any extra effort. You're, you're just going to a different room. You're just doing something a little bit different. Yep. And that's really all it is. It's just, Oh, this is different. This is new. Um, which is why um, among the best things you can do for your own innovation and creativity is different, read, read a blog article you wouldn't normally read, listen to a podcast that you wouldn't normally listen to, have a conversation with somebody you wouldn't normally uh, have a conversation with, do something. Um, one of the things that, again, in your podcast with Emily, she says she's taking up the drums. She's learning something new, yeah. learning, mm -hmm. learn a new language, learn a musical instrument, just learn anything. There's all kinds of resources out there both for free and paid on this internet, you know, there's no excuse no. to not be able to learn something new. And all of a sudden your brain is like, oh, 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 okay, we're doing this now. Okay, this is this is different. And you'll find things just start to happen. When all of a sudden you, when all of a sudden you inform your brain that, okay, you know what we're going to do? We're going to be a learning, thinking, connecting machine now. And you build those habits, your brain will go, okay. I mean, your brain is your servant, not vice, mm -hmm. not, 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 not vice versa, not, not the other way around. You know, you give it good good ideas and good input. Ask it interesting questions and ask it for different different challenges. It'll come through, and you'll be amazed at what starts to happen almost by magic. You're listening to They Don't Teach This in Business School. I'm the host Julie B, and I'm here today with Bill Stainton. And Bill, we have been having a fantastic conversation. And I'm about to hit you with the heavy hitters. Are you ready uh -oh. for these questions? I am not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not at all. No, no, no. I'd be lying if I said I was. All right. Question number one. How do you define success? Wow. Um, I don't define it in terms of money. I mean, money is a measure and we need money. Of course, that's that's important. Um, I think success is that I'm pursuing, not necessarily achieving yet, pursuing Interesting work, interesting to me, that makes a difference in the world, however I define that world. And maybe it's my relationship, maybe it's my community, maybe it's my clients, but the pursuit of interesting work that serves the world. All right. Question number two, that's a heavy hitter. What legacy do you hope to leave? What do you mean aside from Bill Nye the Science Guy? <laughs> yeah, what does Bill Stanton, the Emmy Award-winning keynote Hall of Fame speaker, hope to leave as a legacy? Well, you know, the easy answer is I like I would like people to think that you know the world was better for him having been here. Um, but I, 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 I guess that's it. You know, he he made a difference, made people laugh. Um, on on a bigger level. I think I want, I'm kind of on a mission to help people realize that they are innovators, hmm. that it's not an exclusive club to which they're not, um, you know, can't be a member. Because I think so many people think that, that I'm, I'm hmm. not creative because to be creative, you have to be, you have to be a genius. Uh, you have to be a rocket scientist. You have to come up with something that's earth shattering um, and it's, you're either born with it or you're not. Mm -hmm. None of those things are true. And so many people go through these lives of quiet desperation because they don't, they think, well, that's, that's not for, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's a club. That's, that's the red carpet that I'm not yeah. able to go to. You know, the bouncers have said, no, not you. It's these people, the cool mm -hmm. kids. We're all the cool kids. We <laughs> all have the ability. And the sooner we realize that, the sooner we can start making a difference go like, oh, I am 
it's it's only it's all it is is a mindset. Yeah. If you believe you're creative, you will create that reality for yourself. That's that's all it is. And I want to create a world where people believe that, yeah, I'm creative. And creative doesn't necessarily mean that you're putting on a clown nose every Friday or something like that. Yeah. Creative just means that you're curious about the world and you're like, oh, I can make this better. What if I did this? What if this? What if this happened? And you're learning new things and connecting different dots and that sort of thing. It's a much more vibrant way to go through life. And if I can help more people mm -hmm. experience that, I think that that would be the legacy I wouldn't mind having. There, there was a time in my journey as a business owner where mm -hmm. I did not think I was creative. Wow. And when I tell people that's, that's, that- That's surprising coming from you. When I tell people that, they're shocked. And I remember, and my my coach remembers the moment I called her. I was on my way to a doctor's appointment. I, I know huh. exactly where I was. <laughs> and I called her and I said, oh my gosh, Angie, I think I'm actually creative. <laughs> she was oh, like, oh yeah, duh. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you remember what 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 the what the what the inflection point was? I I don't exactly remember what it was. It was I think it was when I realized I could write a book or that I had a lot of and I was I also started making videos um for YouTube for my marketing agency. Right, right. Sure. Mm -hmm. Those were like the two things and I had I think I had thought, you know, told my so because you know my background as an accountant and a cpa you're not typically known for being super creative uh but i think i had just thought that about myself but i started kind of playing around with video editing software and a lot of other things and i it just hit me one day i was like i i'm a creative person <laughs> yeah. it's interesting one of the things i do during during my, my uh uh primary keynote in fact, I'm going to be speaking to a group of CPAs uh, in just a few weeks. Mm -hmm. And I ask them, okay, so when you think of creative type people, who do you think of? And they, you know, musicians, poets, dancers, actors, but, you know, okay. When you think of non-creative people, who do you think of? The first answer is always accountants. Even when I'm speaking to groups of accountants, it's always, <laughs> it's us. It, we're terrible. It's us. And we're then boring. I prove to them within 15 minutes that they are creative because I have them do an yeah. activity. It's like, oh, 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 this is it. Oh, this is what innovation is. Well, I can do this. Oh, this is creativity. Yeah, I can do this. Yeah. They end up being some of the most creative audiences I have, some of the most creative clients I have. Mm -hmm. So so I love I, I love that that you actually called your coach on the way to the doctor and said, I I think I think I might be creative. <laughs> and her answer was said was literally, well, yeah. That's what Duh. She said to me. <laughs> Everybody oh, knew about me, you know, it's one of those moments of, oh yeah, okay, here we go. Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, Bill, as we're coming to the end of our uh, conversation here today, I've enjoyed this so much. In fact, I oh, me I, too. Would, I want to have you back at some point um, to to continue our conversation. Awesome. But as we're coming to the end of this one, I ask this question of everybody I have on the show. Yeah. If you were going to teach a class to future business owners, um, what what is the one one or two main things you would want them to walk away from your class with? I think the first thing is goes back to when you asked me what the biggest mistake was that I made. Um, I would I would want to teach, especially entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. um, that it's it's a business. You you've mm -hmm. got to get the business part right. Yes, you love what you're doing, but mm -hmm. you don't seem to. But remember, there's 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 the business. You've you're running a business. I'm not a speaker. I'm a mm -hmm. CEO who runs a speaking business. I'm not a mm -hmm. consultant. I'm a CEO who runs a consulting business. I'm a business owner who runs mm -hmm. this kind of a business. And it took me so long to get there. And it's still, I'm still not 100% there. It's it's still a journey for me. Yeah. So I would I would want them to to really grasp that that that's important. That said, I would also want them to grasp that you've got to enjoy what you're doing. I don't believe in the adage that, you know, do what you love, the money will follow. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's really bad advice. I think that's practically malpractice. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But so I don't think do what you love and the money will follow. But if you can, love what you do. Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. boy, that really does make, make a difference. I, I love working with my clients. I love with my audience. I love that. And I'm, I'm sure you know this. Too, I love that look in their eyes where they go like, ooh, oh. Oh, that's I never thought of it that way before. And all of a sudden there's just, you know, oh, I'm making a difference. Like the old Starfish story. Oh, made a difference to that one. 
you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that's uh so find find that part of the business that you just absolutely love and hang on to that. But don't forget, it is a business. Mm, that's that is fantastic advice. Well, Bill, listen, I have so enjoyed our conversation and I know the business owners who will listen to it will love it as well. I just want to thank you again for being on the show today. Oh, thanks, Julie. This is an absolute blast. You are uh, you're really good at this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And that, let me tell you something coming from you. Uh, how many, just tell me again, how many Emmys you won? Um, <clears throat> 29. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, that I am going to take that as the compliment of the week for this week, Aww. because that, that means a lot to me. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And thank, thanks for having me. This is so much fun. And that is a wrap on this episode, but please subscribe to this podcast on your favorite platform so that you don't miss out on any of these kinds of conversations. I'm Julie B, and they don't teach this in business school.